good afternoon to you all. It's an honor for me to introduce Professor P. L. Vishveshwar Rao, sir. He did his MA, MCJ, MPhil, and PhD in journalism. He was a principal, College of Arts and Social Sciences, Usmania University, coordinator of SAP DRS program of the department. He had a very rich experience of 30 years of teaching. He joined as a lecturer in the Department of Communication and Journalism. He worked about seven years in University of Hyderabad, head and dean at Department of Communication, Sarojini Naidu School for Performing Arts and Communication. He worked here as a professor of journalism here in Manu, corporate communication, media management, and media laws and ethics. Today, he is going to speak on higher education, challenges, issues, and new policy in higher education, I think, which is very much needed for all the participants. I am sure you will enjoy his lecture. He is a very good speaker. I invite sir to enlighten us with your valuable views. I am happy both the director and the deputy director of this, uh, one of the leading uh, colleges, academy staff college of the country, they are also there. And my dear participants who come from all over the country, I also take uh, this opportunity to welcome all of you. I think this is the second day to the Academic Staff College uh, program. Well, what I do, normally when I come here, we discuss about what's happening in the field of uh, higher education, what are the major challenges uh, this country is facing in terms of higher education, and I will also in the process of my presentation, I will try to review some of the initiatives which the Government of India has been doing for the last many, many years. And it is one of the major initiatives the Government takes every five years, every ten years, in terms of how they should go about you know, bettering the quality of education. I am only going to be sharing whatever understanding I have about uh, the education in this country. As a teacher, I've spent about you know, 30, 35 years in the classrooms, both here and the University of Hyderabad, and then I spent some time teaching abroad also. So I will look at it, you know, some issues rather critically, and then you know, open it for discussion. I plan to take only about you know, 45 minutes or so to make a presentation. I am one of those people who believe that communication is not a monologue, communication is a dialogue. And many of us have that problem because you know, we get into the classroom and spend 45-50 minutes you know, teaching without allowing you know, much of a discussion. But let me, I think you know, it's very, very important because you know, there are you know, several people, I looked at your background from different kinds of disciplines, from social sciences, from literature, from humanities and sciences. There are you know, participants with different kinds of background from different kinds of uh, universities. In the first five or six minutes, I will look at what is the role of a university, or what is the role of education, what is the role of a, a college. I think you know, that perspective we need to have. There are different people who you know, look at it you know, differently, but then you know, I would like to look at it you know, from my standpoint. I think it's very, very important when we are talking about you know, university education, it has to facilitate and it has to create an intellectual environment. I'm one of those people who believe that you know, when you're talking about you know, colleges and universities, they're not simply skill-oriented institutions. They're not like a polytechnics. Colleges and universities are places of ideas, places of ideologies. And I think it's very, very important that you know, colleges and universities have to create you know, that kind of an intellectual environment or academic environment. And it is in colleges and universities, a lot of discussion has to take place, a lot of debate has to take place, and there's no one way of looking at you know, issues. There are several ways of looking at it, those issues. When students are looking at those issues, when academics are looking at those issues, how are we looking at them? With what kind of a framework are we looking at? With what kind of a intellectual standpoint you know, we are looking at it is very, very important. Any kind of an idea, any kind of a thought you know, we generate in uh, colleges and universities has to be backed up with uh, evidence, backed up with theory, backed up with knowledge. 
It's very, very important. We are not going to be making any kind of an observation just like that. But is that observation backed with some kind of theoretical framework, with that kind of some kind of an intellectual framework? So that's where I think it's important for me when you're talking about universities, have to facilitate that kind of an intellectual environment, intellectual ferment is number one role of a university. The second function of a college or university in terms of education is to develop creativity among students. I think at a point of time when we are talking about you know, artificial intelligence growing in a very big way, it's very, very important that you know, are we developing that kind of a creativity among students? That is the role of a college or a university. Creativity and ability to look at issues rather critically, that's another function. And I think when it's very important to you know when I'm talking about the role of a university. University does much more than merely organize classes and gives out degrees to students. When you look at you know, all the policy making which has been done in this country, starting from the Kotari Commission report to the Knowledge Commission report, and now you know, we are talking about an education policy, all of them you know, I have been saying all along for the last 60 years in this country, a university does much more than merely organize classes, give out degrees to students. And all the time, you know, unfortunately, a great deal of emphasis is there in terms of colleges and universities, you know, how to go about you know, organizing classes, how to go about you know, giving out degrees to students. That's not the only role of a college or a university. Why is that I'm saying? Because you know, it shapes you know, young minds. One of the major functions of a college or university when students come into the classroom, we have to shape their young minds. Not only shape young minds, change also their mindset. A mindset. It is very, very important to know, are we, are we making them think? Are we changing their young minds, change their mindset? And as all of you know, that majority of the students come from very, very challenging kind of a background. I'm one of those people who believe very strongly and very passionately when I talk about this because the, the, the plurality and the diversity in the classroom is changing every year. It was much, much easier perhaps you know, to teach you know, 30, 40 years ago. But today, first generation learners are coming into the classroom with, with difficult kind of a social background, but difficult kind of an economic background. They are coming in because there's a lot of plurality in the classroom lot of diversity there in the in the classroom we have policies of affirmative action which we need to have because you know the idea is to get you know a lot of them you know would not have in fact you know, if you look at you know the discussion in the policy making in terms of you know education policies in this country to give access to more and more students you know who are coming into colleges and universities very very key word access and equity not only we are trying to provide them access, but then you know, we are also trying to see that they get equity and equality in terms of education. If you look at, you know, in terms of uh, 60s and 70s, that kind of a diversity and plurality was not there in the classroom, but then, you know, as I've said, first generation learners are coming in and we need to provide, you know, that kind of access and that kind of equity and quality education for all of them. Then it shapes, you know, young minds and develop uh, changes in their mindsets. The other uh, important uh, thing, it also has to develop, you know, leadership among, you know, people who are coming into colleges and universities. After all, you know, we are a democracy and we are the largest democracy in the world. It is very, very important that, you know, are we? I'm not talking about, you know, when I'm talking about leadership, I'm not simply talking about, you know, political leadership, but then technological leadership, scientific leadership, scientific uh, leadership, people who know who can head organizations, leadership in the broader sense, you know, I'm trying to use, I'm not trying to use only in terms of you know, political leadership. Everywhere we need to have to govern institutions, to govern colleges, to govern uh, scientific uh, institutions, we need to have that kind of a, a leadership. In other words, you know, we need to have that kind of a intellectual prowess, intellectual ability, and also develop leadership. <coughs> And lastly, when you are talking about the purpose of education, it has to promote rational, logical thinking. It's very, very important. Are we developing, you know, students, the rationality of mind? Rationality of mind, logical thinking, logical ability is very, very important. And if you look at, you know, all the policy documents, you know, which have been 
uh, formulated in this country do talk about you know that that rational thinking rationality of mind scientific temper scientific temper if you look at you know the kotari commission report which and later many other reports you know talk, talked about you know, are we inculcating that kind of a scientific temper among uh, students because everything you know we are trying to rationalize everything you know we are trying to logically think and then are we promoting that kind of a rationality of thinking is very very important and then to sum it up in terms of you know what is the role of a university a role of a college for my understanding in short university should mold the future generations is very very important we are dealing with you know students you know, who come with very at a critical age when they come into colleges they are 18 and then they are coming into universities you know maybe 20 23 24 and are we shaping this future generations mold future generations and in that kind of a context i think education has got a very important role to, role to play because the whole world is looking to india india is a young nation 70% of our population is below 30. 70% of our population is below 30. And when the rest of the world is having, you know, aged population, but India's population is a young population. And that population is growing rather rapidly. So in that kind of a context, it's very, very important when I'm talking about are we shaping, you know, the future generations is important. That, that is where. And we are talking about you know, knowledge society. We are talking about knowledge economy and that's where education becomes power education becomes power why are we having so many colleges and so many universities in this country to give that kind of a future generation ability to critical look at issues critically scientifically logically develop you no know, rationality or uh, rationality of mind and that's how you know, i look at you know, the role and purpose of a university university and then, you know, another important aspect I think, you know, we need to look at, there are two important factors we need to look at in terms of education. Number of uh, universities we have, number of colleges we have, number of colleges we have. And education is one sector which is growing rather rapidly. If you look at, you know, in 1947 we got freedom, there were only about, you know, 14, 15 universities in India. But today, there are several universities and it's one sector which is growing rather rapidly. Why is it growing rather rapidly? Because as I've said, 70% of our population is young population and we need to provide access, we need to provide equity, we also need to provide you know, the quality of education for all of them in these universities, you know, which are growing rather, rapid, rather uh, rapidly. So in that kind of a context, you know, I firmly feel, feel that when you are talking about you know, the development of higher education must figure as one of the highest national priorities in India. The growth and development of education should figure as one of the, I'm quoting again, development of higher education must figure as one of the highest national priorities in India. And I'm sure all of you will have you know, different kind of a perspective on this. I'm saying that should be a, a national priority. To what extent you know, it is a national priority? What are we doing in terms of you know, trying to promote you know, higher education in this country? And I'm also of the firm opinion that higher education is not a luxury. It's essential for social development and economic development. It's absolutely important. There is, a, there is you know, some kind of an opinion, some of them saying that you know, it is a luxury, can be afford all of them you know, coming into colleges and universities, should we have access to the entire population getting into university and education. My, from my standpoint, higher education is not, is not a luxury, it's essential for survival, it is essential for social and political development. In that kind of a context, I think you know, it's also important to look at broadly. Broadly, India is one country which has got you know, different kinds of segmentation of you know, universities in India. There are a lot of gradations of universities in India. We have got in this country general universities, we have got science and technology universities, we got women's universities, we have open universities, we have agriculture universities, we have medical colleges, we have language universities, we have central universities are growing, we have central universities, we also have deemed universities and state universities and institutions of national importance. When all of you put together 
there are almost little over 800 institutions are there in this, in this country. And if you look at it in 1947, as I've said, we only had about 14 or 15 institutions. But now, you know, when you come to 2017, 18, we've got to you know general universities are growing, science and technology universities are growing. There are many, many women's universities, open universities, agriculture universities, medical colleges, language universities, self universities, and deemed universities and state universities and institutions of national importance. Later, if I have some, some, some time, I will talk about we are going to be amending the constitution very soon to see that foreign universities also come to India as part of the foreign, foreign direct investment. Once some of the foreign universities come to India, there are going to be a lot of implications for you know, expansion and growth of the universities. Should they come in? And I'm sure it's a very contentious issue. But then, as you know, as part of the WTO, as part of the GATS agreement, as part of the foreign direct investment, there are many, many of them you know, are interested in establishing universities in India, foreign universities in India. And then briefly, if you have time, you know, we'll talk about you know, the implications of them. When you look at, you know, broadly the enrollment of higher education in India, starting from the Kotari Commission to the new education policy, and all of them I've been saying that, you know, in fact, you know, the Knowledge Commission, when it was constituted, they said by 2015, we need to have almost 30% getting into colleges and universities. Colleges and universities. But when you look at, you know, the broadly, the enrollment in this country, even after 70 years of democracy, almost 75% of them do not really have access to higher education in India. About 20 years ago, it was only 7%, 8%, 10%, and then, you know, it's now, you know, stands somewhere around, including, including the education you know, which are offering, you know, through distance education and open universities in this country is only 25% in the age group of 18 to 24. After even 75 years, that's a very, very key point. But the, one of the major challenges, you know, we are facing. Every report talks about, you know, how do we go about having inclusive education? How do we go about you know, getting the marginalized sections, you know, which did not have opportunity to get into education to get into education? I'm making it, you know, popular in terms of my presentation because, you know, different people are from different kinds of backgrounds. That's why, you know, I'm making this presentation a little popular so that, you know, all of you will understand because all of you are not students of education theory. And these kind of presentations, you know, we need to have general popular kind of presentation so that, you know, we will have you know, some, for, some time for discussion. So, if you look at, you know, from all reports in this country, one of the major challenges have been, one of the major issues in this country has been how to get in more and more people into the realm of education, the domain of higher education. After making rapid strides, making a lot of effort, a lot of effort, we are not in a position to still get because when you look at Kotari Commission, was one report which looked at it very, very critically. As long as you know, we do not strengthen school education, as long as you know, we do not strengthen our primary schools, we will not be in a position to get to you know the right kind of students for universities and colleges. That still, you know, in the last 60 years, you know, we have been discussing and we'll continue to discuss that issue because that is one of the major challenges we have in this country. What is the nature of students who are getting into colleges and universities? What is the profile of students, you know, which are coming into colleges and universities? Because if you look at you know, the NASCOM report, I'm only talking about technical education, engineering education, NASCOM report is saying many of the industry professionals and specialists are saying not even 20% of the graduates who are passing out from engineering colleges and technology colleges have employable skill. So we are grappling about two issues here, both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality. There are two major concerns of this country, both in terms of, you know, the quantity of students you know, we have in higher education, though you know, we have been planning, though you know, all, all kinds of reform has been taking place in terms of higher education, several policy documents you know, we have seen, several, several policy initiatives you know, we have seen, even then you know, we only have 25% of them in colleges and universities, that is one. The second important aspect, I will talk about it a little later, is in terms of the you know, nature of quality we have. When NASCOM, one of the major uh, uh, you know, recruitment agencies, they carried out a survey and said that you know, not even 20% of them are employable. Industry is not in a position to accept them. Accept them.
So that is one. That is one. But I, at the same time, I think you know, it's important also for me to raise this issue. Among the several surveys you know, which have been carried out in this country, among the top 200 universities in the world, India does not figure. That's another major concern we have. Of course, you know, now we have got a national uh, ranking framework. Framework that is going about, you know, giving you know where universities and colleges, you know, uh, stand among the top 200 universities in the world. India does not stand anywhere. Some of the IITs figure somewhere in the Institute of Management, in the Institute of Sciences figure, but the mainstream universities really do not figure. That does not mean anything. That is not a reflection on you know, nature and quality of education which are offering. But then, when you go by international criteria. International criteria among the top 200 universities, India does not figure anywhere. But what is important for us in terms of you know, the, the enrollment ratio, as I've said, it is about 20, 25% right now. But if you look at you know, some of the developed countries, developed countries, if you look at you know, Canada as a nation, it is 100%. All of them are in the age group of 18 to 24 are in colleges and universities in Canada. And if you take a country like USA, it's almost about 85%. 85% of them. And Canada is a capitalist, uh, America is a capitalist country, as all of you know. It's a capitalist country. They've got, you know, 85%. If you take a country like Australia, it is 80%. If you take Finland, it's about 75%. New Zealand, 65%. Norway, 65%. France, 55%. Netherlands, 52%. United Kingdom, 60%. United Kingdom, last time, you know, when they went in for uh, their election, their major agenda was education, quality education, and improvement in education. Education was a major agenda for them. Major agenda for them. Though, of course, you know, several policy documents are there in this country, and we have been talking about you know, enhancing the quality of education, but we did not get you know, that kind of enrollment so far. It's only 25%. When you look at you know, Spain, it's again you know, 56%. Denmark, if you look at you know, is 65%. Austria, small country, is 64%. Germany, 55%. Sweden, also 60%. Italy, Japan, Belgium are all in the range of 30 to 40%. <laughs> The only country which is less than India are two countries, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Pakistan, if you if are interested in the figure, Pakistan is about now, you know, 10%. And if you look at Bangladesh, a little higher, Bangladesh is around 11%. And of course, you know, then we also have Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is also about 12%. But if you look at the rest of the countries, even the developing countries, so like South Korea, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, are reasonably very high. Reasonably very high. So this is one of the major challenges we have. How do we go about you know, getting it? How do we go about you know, strengthening the school education and primary education and you know, so that you know, many of them can come to colleges and universities? And if you look at you know, why, they are not in a position to come. Almost about you know, 60 to 70 percent of them in our schools drop out before they complete 10th class or 12th class. That's one of the major concerns you know, we have in India. Many of them, we are not talking about you know, colleges, uh, we are not talking about schools and universities which are located in cities and towns. But then you know, if you look at, as I've said, if one of the major challenges in this country in terms of higher education is the diversity and the plurality we are dealing with. Dealing with. The social background and the economic background, when you take of, you know, of a huge country like India. We are, we are talking about 130 crore population. We are the largest population. Next to China, we are the largest population in this country. And how do we go about you know, dealing with this huge population that, that they will have? That they will have. Again, I'm talking about this huge population in the age group of 18 to 24. How can they come into colleges and universities? That is one. And the second important dimension is all policies, documents, all along have been saying. I'm talking about the earlier new education policy and including other commissions have been saying we need to invest 6% in higher education. We have to invest 6% in higher education. 
Can anyone make a guess on how much are we investing right now in a higher education? Yeah, around that much. Around that much. In some, some years, you know, it varies. In some years, it comes down. A little over 2%, you know, we are in, here investing in higher education. Several policy documents in this country said, you know, we need to invest 6% of our GDP in higher education. Are we moving in that direction? Yes, there is a priority. There is a concern in this country that we need to have good institutions, outstanding institutions, institutions of excellence, institutions of excellence in this country. So that kind of a standpoint, I would like to raise, you know, some issues, you know, which are very, very important, you know, for our discussion. These are the concerns, these are the challenges, and this is what, you know, the various policy documents, you know, have been. Number one, they are saying we must, you know, in terms of enhancing the quality of education in this country, the policy documents, I'm only trying to summarize you know, some of the policy documents because it's not possible in two to one of years to review all the policies you know, which have been constituted in this country. But if you look at the major uh, policy documents, I've been saying one of the major things in this country, we must have a policy to strengthen facilities in higher education, both in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure, both in terms of faculty, we need to strengthen. And now you know, if we look at you know, data, many of the universities in this country in the last you know, 10, 15 years have not made any substantial recruitment. When I'm talking about facilities, I'm not simply talking about infrastructure alone. And if we look at, you know, I will just you know, give four or five points. These documents all along I've been saying, you know, that you know, we must have a policy to strengthen facilities in higher education. And number two, they have been saying we must take enormous care in establishing new universities. Mushrooming of universities is taking place. If you look at, you know, particularly, you know, some of you come from Telangana and Andhra. If you look at, you know, Telangana and Andhra, almost, you know, Telangana, if you take every district, almost has got a university. How many of you from Telangana here? Yeah, I know. Many of them, you know, the quality of, they're, they're not even having, you know, a position of a, a degree college or a junior college. No recruitment has taken place. I don't want to get into nitty-gritty details of you know, the nature of recruitment you know, which has been taking place in the country, but then it's very, very important you know, when you're talking about care in establishing new universities. Why is that I'm saying? That you know, we must take care in establishing new universities because when we are talking about today, we are talking about choice-based credit system. And if you're going to be talking about choice-based credit system, which almost now, almost the entire country is implementing, you need to have multidisciplinary courses, multidisciplinary subjects, multidisciplinary subjects. Someone who was doing science that perhaps in a Chupna position to take a couple of credits in humanities. Humanities. And many of them, you know, when I'm raising this issue, they, we, have, we have gone in for choice-based credit system without offering any kind of a choice. What is the kind of a credit we are giving them? What is the kind of a choice you are giving them? They are language universities, they are only humanities universities, they are only teaching science. The idea is, you know, in terms of a choice-based credit system, a student who is doing science should be in a position to take a course in humanities and languages. So, so we must take care, take care in terms of establishing new universities and then, you know, that, you know, they should be multidisciplinary. Look at, you know, the number of universities in the world, MIT. They have technology courses, engineering courses, they've got humanities. One of the leading intellectuals of the world, Noam Chomsky. How many of you have heard of Noam Chomsky? Yeah. One of the leading public intellectuals of the world, a leading critic of American policy, is a professor of linguistics there. He teaches linguistics, but he writes on foreign policy, he writes on economics, he writes on several issues of public concern. Public concern. So it is very, very important that we need to have when you're talking about universities, we need to have multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, we need to have, you know, we need to have courses in technology. But this is one peculiar kind of a scenario which is emerging in this country now. When you look at, you know, many of them, the growth you know, which is taking place in this university is only in terms of technology, engineering, and management and science education. A university has to be multidisciplinary. That is what you know, various committees, co committees and commissions have talked about it. We cannot have two or three disciplines. If you look at you know, the mushrooming of you know, the so-called you know, private universities which are emerging in India, there are almost about 200 private universities in India now, right now. There are over 200 
private universities in India and private university education is rather growing rather rapidly. And I think you know we need to question you know, what is the role of the state then? State is also should provide, provide education, quality education from the standpoint of you know, what we have in the Indian constitution. Indian talk, constitution talks about you know, equality and equal opportunity. But then if you look at private universities are mushrooming, private universities are growing in a big way. And many of the private universities are not multidisciplinary in nature, but they're also offering choice-based credit systems. They're also offering choice-based courses. What kind of a choice they're going to be offering if you only have technology, engineering, and management courses? So that is one important, and uh, I, I think it's very, very important that we need to take care in establishing, and special care must be taken in terms of you know, organizing new disciplines and new courses, particularly at the postgraduate level. Particularly at the postgraduate level. Are we paying attention? Undergraduate education is one aspect, but then, you know, many, many colleges and many, many universities are now are into postgraduate education. And what is the nature of syllabus we have? What is the nature of curriculum we have? I will raise those issues. What are the parameters which are important in terms of quality assurance in higher education? What are the parameters which will go making a university, an outstanding university, an excellent university? Then, you know, it's also important, now of course, you know, all along, you know, the policy making has been, in this country has been talking about established center for advanced studies should be strengthened. That is one direction I think, you know, we have been growing rather, rather well. Many, many universities now, you know, have got you know, advanced centers in terms of certain major areas of study. It is very, very crucial that, you know, we need to treat, you know, the center for advanced studies, you know, a little differently. In many of the central universities now, there are center for advanced studies in terms of social sciences, in terms of public administration, in terms of management, in terms of public policy, in terms of public policy, or in terms of sciences, there are you know, some advanced centers you know, which are emerging. And we need to strengthen you know, these advanced centers much more. And then, very, very important need for research. And if you look at all the policy documents all along in the country, I've been talking about need for research. And I know many of you who come from undergraduate colleges, you really don't have that kind of infrastructure, that kind of a facility, that kind of a facility. I'm sure you know, your workload is about almost about 16 to 18 to 20 hours. Yes or no? Yeah. It is about 18 hours. 15 hours. Yeah. Certainly universities are slightly better. The workload perhaps is about 10, 12, or 14. Yeah, she's saying no. Yeah. Possible. Yeah, but then. According to the University Grants Commission, we are supposed to be teaching undergraduate level, or graduate level, about 16 hours, associate professors, and then professors, you know, teach less. But then, whenever I come and interact with people like you, they said, where is the facility for us to do research? Where are the labs? Where are the libraries for us to do that kind of a research? Because in terms of promotion policy of the government, all of us, same criteria, we need to follow academic performance indicators. And academic performance indicators primarily talk about the you know, nature of publications you have, nature, nature of research you have, that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is one aspect. And the other important <coughs> thing you know, which we have been talking about in terms of policy making is to reflect on critical socio-economic context. Educational institutions are not in the sky. It is very, very important these universities and colleges have to look at social, political, economy, economic reality of India. It is universities you know, which are supposed to be generating that kind of a knowledge in terms of you know, doing research relating to policy making issues of you know, economic issues or social issues or political issues in this country. Very, very important. If there's any kind of a policy making which has to emerge, it has to emerge only from universities. And that is where I emphasized the need for research. What is the nature of policy research we are doing? And all the policy documents have been talking about, you know, the role of the universities to, is to reflect, reflect rather critically on various socioeconomic issues, women's issues, gender issues, subaltern studies, marginalized sections, policy making for science. And this has to emerge only from colleges and universities. And that is one of the major roles a university will have to play. And then, you know, it's also one of the major concerns in this country is to have greater autonomy for colleges and universities. 
all policy documents have been encouraging in terms of you know, trying to do, trying to encourage autonomy in universities, universities by its functioning itself are independent, are autonomous. We do not go by what the government says. We are independent people in terms of policy making, in terms of nature of courses we need to have, nature of curriculum we need to have, nature of syllabus we need to have. That's where I think you know, it is very, very important that we need to have that kind of an autonomy. But when you look at the situation in this country, not many autonomous colleges are there in India. The estimates indicate right now we have got about you know, around 500 autonomous colleges all over the country, among the over 50,000 colleges we have in India. 50,000 colleges we have in India. And one of the major concerns is how do we go about you know, making, giving them autonomy, freedom to formulate their own courses, freedom to formulate their own syllabus, freedom to have your own curriculum. Curriculum, that is a very important dimension. But at the same time, I think it's important for me to raise, India is one country where we have concept of affiliation. Very, we are a colonial country, we still have that concept of affiliation. And that is where the other important issue is in terms of governance of these colleges. How do we go about you know, governing these colleges? Every university is having 100, 200, 400, 500 affiliated colleges. And I, I'm sure all of you also come from some of the affiliated colleges. Affiliated colleges. How do we govern these affiliating colleges? The college is located, university is located in Hyderabad, a university is located in Lucknow, but then you have, you know, the concept of affiliation. That has been one of the major concerns in terms of, you know, how do we go about, you know, ensuring quality in these affiliated colleges? That is a major challenge, you know, we are facing. If you now, you know, take, you know, in Hyderabad, we have got, you know, JNTU, it has got 400 engineering colleges. If you take Usmani University, it has got almost seven to 800 affiliating colleges. At one point of time, they had more universities. Take Andhra University, or take Central Universities do not have you know, that, that issue. Central Universities do not have. They only govern from one campus, except you know, one or two universities like Maulana. It has got you know, other kinds of centers. Other kinds of centers. Delhi University is one of them, which has got you know, some affiliating universities. Otherwise, if you look at you know, JNU, if you look at you know, University of Hyderabad, really very, very Good institutions, outstanding universities in the country do not have the concept of affiliation. Why is that I'm talking about affiliation? Affiliation and quality are related. What are these colleges? What kind of a governance, academic governance is there in these colleges? Are they reviewing the syllabus? What kind of an examination system they have? What kind of a feedback mechanism they have? What is the nature of evaluation they have? Is also very, very important. Very, very important for us. What kind of a feedback? mechanism we have. I do not know how many of you sitting here at, at the end of the semester you get you know, feedback from the students. And I'm one of, those, one of those people who firmly believe that feedback can only be done by the students. It's very important that we need to get. What do they think about what we have taught? What do they think about you know, the nature of syllabus we have? Is that syllabus adequate? Did we go about you know, dealing with them? Have we enhanced their knowledge? Knowledge. Have they become a little more, you know, have they a better understanding of the subject, you know, what they have taught? Have you developed their curiosity so that, you know, they can go about spending more time in the library? All that is very, very important because this is a colonial practice. Affiliation is a colonial practice and we are still continuing. As I've said, you know, why I'm talking about, you know, this colonial practice, because that does affect, you know, the quality of higher education we are offering in this country. We do not know the nature of syllabus we have, nature of faculty they have, nature of feedback mechanism they have, nature of exam they have. We really do not know. That becomes a major concern. And then, you know, another important uh, is protect it from degradation. There is a big question mark in this country in terms of nature of quality of higher education we are offering. I only talked about you know, professional colleges such as engineering and technology, but there is also a major concern in this country about what is the knowledge level of students who are passing out from these colleges and universities. There are two dimensions I've been raising. One about professional colleges, but one from colleges like this. Colleges like this, where are they going? 
When you look at the top 200 universities in the world, number one criteria they have is, where are your students placed? The number one criteria for them is, well, you have produced all right, 1,000 graduates from your university, where are they placed? What is the placement? In which company they are working? Are they working in the right kind of a company? Are they working in a good company? Is very, very important. Right now, no, we do not have data from your colleges to find out, to make any kind of an observation. Where are they placed? We don't even know. Are they getting into higher education? Are they getting into MCOM? Are they getting into MA? Are they getting into MSc? Are they getting into good companies? What is the nature of companies they have? Placement is very, very important. Education has got a purpose. The purpose is to provide them knowledge, provide them skill, and also provide them employable knowledge and employable skill. So that is one of the major concerns you know, we have in terms of you know, colleges which are, which are growing. So that becomes another important uh, parameter. And then, as I've already said, you know, we need to take care in terms of what are the new courses. Knowledge is growing rather rapidly. Rather rapidly. New courses have got to be science. Earlier we were only talking about, you know, maybe teaching botany, and chemistry, political science, economics, and other kinds of subjects. But today we're talking about nanosciences. Today we're talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, getting in those kind of subjects, bioinformatics, nanosciences, sciences. Are we, are we, that is a major concern again. How quickly are we updating our curriculum? Are we getting the right experts to evaluate, to decide what we need to teach in, you know, sciences or humanities or languages or social sciences is very, very important. I'll come to that issue a little later. That is one. Very important in terms of for our discussion. What is the special emphasis we are making in terms of linguistic competence? Language competence. That's one of the major challenges we have in, in this country. What is the linguistic competence of students? When we get into the classroom, we are really facing the challenge. And what kind of a language, you know, should we be teaching? Many of the universities have got different kinds of languages. Languages. I'm not talking about, you know, competence only in English. But I'm also talking about competence in Marathi, or Urdu, or Kannada, or whatever kind of language, you know, we are teaching it. Many of them are not in a position to analyze, as I've said. It's important. We are looking at the critical thinking. We are looking at the critical judgment. We are looking at that ability to describe an issue, describe a concept, elaborate a concept, elaborate a concept. I know country is going in a different kind of a direction. Most of them, unfortunately, we are in multiple choice. Can we have you know, that kind of a system of you know, a student you know, simply saying A or B or C or D? And we are landing up with the situation in many, many universities now. Admissions for PhD are given on the basis of a multiple choice. If you give AAA, perhaps you know, you'll get 35 marks. B is a very popular choice, you'll get 40 marks. C is there, D is there. Should we have? So that is where you know, I'm talking about what is their competence. The role of a college or university is to develop that kind of a language competence, linguistic competence. They must have the ability to explain a concept, elaborate a concept, and look at, you know, uh, critically. And then, we already talked about you know, research. We'll have to get, you know, enhanced support, both in colleges and universities. We are not giving, you know, the kind of importance you know, we need to give for research. There must be greater funding and colleges and universities encourage students, in, uh, encourage faculty in terms of you know, how they should go about you know, participating in various kinds of seminars and activity, and then, then only it is possible for us to do that kind of research. And uh, one of the major things you know, we have been talking about now is the National Coordination Body for Sharing Resources. You know, though education, as I've said, is growing, but then should we depend? Should we not share our resources? There was some kind of a thinking which was going on all over the country to share resources from one university to another. To another. 
maybe in resources, sharing of resources, it's easy to talk about, but very difficult. Easy to talk, maybe share outstanding teachers, outstanding professors, share in terms of library resources, which we have, that initiative was started some time ago, but it's really not working. But I think, you know, we need to pay attention in terms of, you know, sharing of resources. And we need to have some kind of a national evaluation system. That is what the policy is talking about. What is the evaluation system we have? What is the examination system we have? Should we not get into an evaluation system which is uniform in the country? That is one issue I think, you know, we need to discuss. When I open it for discussion, and I would like to get you know, your feedback in terms of what is the, uh, what is the uh, evaluation system we need to have. Different kind of universities and colleges have got different kinds of a system. There are some of them in a semester. There are some of them who already got into a trimester. We just started working in a semester, experimenting. IITs have already gone into tr trimester. IIMs have already gone into trimester. There are still universities in, I know of, there are you know, still about you know, some 25, 30 universities in this country still working on a year-wise scheme. So we have a year-wise scheme, we have a semester, we have a trimester, we have an internal assessment, we have a choice-based training system, all these are growing. But then, can't we think of having, you know, some kind of a uh, formula, some kind of a common system, can we think about it? Because some of the commissions have been talking about a national evaluation system and having uh, a, a, a common syllabus or a common curriculum. And it's also very important for me to talk about delinking degrees from jobs. I know, though I talked about jobs, the ultimate purpose of a university is not to know only thinking in terms of jobs. I said academic environment, intellectual environment, provide you know, leadership, leadership, all kinds of thinking, all kinds of ideological frameworks have to flourish in colleges and universities. We need to see that, encourage you know, students so that you know, they will think about you know, issues you know, critically. And then, then, some of these are very, very important. What are the parameters which are important for our discussion in terms of quality assurance in higher education? Number one, curriculum aspect. How regularly are we updating our curriculum? This is one of the major issues which all our policies have been talking about. Are we updating curriculum? I have the data from South India. In South India, they say there are almost about 25 to 30 percent of the colleges which have not revised their curriculum in the last five years. I do not know the situation in the rest of the country. I'm sure, you know, by and large, it must be the same. And we are talking about you know, a knowledge era, where knowledge is growing rather rapidly. New research is coming into focus every day. And it's very, very important that we need to review or revise our curriculum regularly. Very, very important to know what kind of a curriculum we have, who is deciding on the curriculum, Do we, are we getting experts to review our curriculum? curriculum? What do students think about you know, earlier curriculum? What are the kind of a feedback you know, we have relating to the programs you know, which we are introducing in the universities? To what extent you know, they are relevant? What kind of a potential they have in terms of employability, jobs? How do we compare our curriculum with the rest of the universities in the country, or maybe rest of the universities, outstanding universities in the world? How do we compare our curriculum? Because I'm one of those people who know who's really concerned about you know, the inequality which is built into higher education in India. That's one of the major challenges you know, we have. Because inequality in the sense, you know, we've got all kinds of structures in the universities. We have central universities, very well funded by the central government. We have state universities. We have institutions of national importance. We have private universities. We have deemed universities. Supreme Court, till only about you know, two years ago, reviewed the status of the deemed universities. What is their condition? What is their status? What are the kind of courses you know, they are offering? Look at you know, the kind of a various kinds of segmentation of education you know, we have in this country. That is where I'm building up an argument, saying that you know, there are certain common parameters are required. These common parameters will bring about you know, the quality of, of higher education. That's where you know, quality assurance in higher education curriculum aspect is one. And then, a part of your curriculum aspect, are we interacting with academic peers? 
academic leaders? Are we interacting with the best of the universities so that you know, we will have a syllabus which is, which is world class? Very, very important in the context of you know, that we are not among the top 200 universities in the world and the country is concerned about it in terms of policy making to become excellent universities. So in that kind of context, curriculum aspect is very, very important. And then interaction with academic uh, peers and employees. And what are the options you know, we are giving? What are the electives we are offering? What are the compulsory subjects you know, we are offering? Are we having that kind of a flexibility for the students in view of the choice-based study system we are talking about? The other aspect, the third important aspect, what is the nature of teaching which is going on? What is the kind of a methodology we are adopting? What is the kind of methodology? It, does our teaching you know, give you know, judging students' knowledge? How are we judging you know, students' knowledge? What is the periodicity of judging their knowledge? How are we judging their knowledge? How are they judging their knowledge? I was reading scripts of one of the universities recently. My own university. It's a PhD exam. First paragraph is in English. Second paragraph is in Telugu. Third paragraph, I don't know what is the language. How do I go about evaluating them? I know I do understand their, their problem. They do not have the language ability. Linguist ability, they're not in a position to communicate. I'm talking about research methodology course at an MPhil level. At an MPhil level. And this, this problem is there in many, many universities. So that's where I think, you know, what is the nature of teaching, you know, are we doing? Are we developing, you know, that kind of an ability in students to comprehend, to understand, you know, the subject. Judging students' knowledge is important. And what is the teaching learning process which is going on? And then, much more important for our discussion, use of technology. I do not know how many of you have access to technology again. There are colleges and colleges and universities and universities which have, which have access to technology. Some of them do not have access to technology. How many you have? How many can go about you know, making a PowerPoint presentation? How many of you can go about you know, multimedia presentation? How many of you have got you know, good labs? Good labs, so that you, know, you can prepare your lectures in such a manner so technology plays an important role in terms of learning. Because I've said, you know, teaching can no longer be a monologue. You've got to make it creative. You've got to make it interesting, informative. And I teach in a college now, one of the leading colleges in the city. I teach about 60 students I've got. I teach, you know, both undergraduate and postgraduate classes. But many of them are not interested in concepts. They say, sir, well, Google is there. So I called, started calling Google, Google Professor Google. It is now replacing. Because all of them go to Google immediately. They are in a, that becomes a challenge. Because they have access to other kinds of technology. They have access to, you know, internet, many other kinds of WhatsApp, etc., etc., etc. they have. And the media, the social media is growing so rapidly. Technology is growing rapidly. So in that kind of a context, you know, it is very, very important to you know when we teach, you know, for those two hours or one hour, are we using technology? The latest study which has been carried out in MIT, one of the leading institutions in the world, which says average attention span of an average student is not even 20 minutes. One of the leading institutions in the world. Average attention span of an average student. Maybe there are some students you know, who have attention span of about 40 minutes or 16 minutes. Their attention span is not less than, is just about you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so. How do we go about you know, making our classes creative, interesting, lively, so that they can assimilate the knowledge we are giving? So use of new technology is important. And then it's also important for us to develop you know, innovative evaluation methods. Evaluation method cannot be just an end semester exam. End semester exam, what is the kind of internal assessment we have? What kind of a skill-based test you know, we have in the classroom? By and large, you know, many of the universities are following internal assessment 40% and then you know, end semester exam, by and large, 60%. It could vary from a university to university. But I'm talking about a general pattern which is prevailing in the country. So it is very, very important then, you know, what is the kind of in innovative evaluation method we have? Many of the central universities have got a lot of autonomy and a lot of flexibility. Flexibility. And I think almost in all central universities, a teacher has a syllabus. Syllabus is discussed, it's democratized. 
leading academic peers from all over the country come and decide on a curriculum. They've got five units by and large, and then you know there are some textbooks, mandatory reading, and then some reference books. Reference books are there, then they've got you know, 40 percent internal assessment, and then evaluation takes place only by the teacher who's teaching who's teaching. But I think in many of the colleges, that pattern is not there. That pattern is not there. Someone sets the syllabus. I teach the syllabus. Someone sets the exam paper. Someone evaluates that exam paper. I do not know whether I taught for a semester. What is that students have understood? Have they understood at all? And it's evaluated by someone who doesn't teach. And I look at you know, the scripts of other college. This kind of a pattern is there. So I think, you know, it is very, very important. A teacher must have the autonomy. Autonomy in terms of the course which has been decided, which has been approved by certain statutory bodies, and then we must have the freedom to evaluate. That's how you know, we know. If I do not get you know, the feedback of my own students, how do I know how much they've understood? What are their challenges? What are their problems? What are their concerns? What are their issues? What are the issues? So it is very, very important that, you know, we need to have. And then innovation and evaluation methods. It doesn't have to be all the time an end semester examination, maybe a seminar, maybe a, a book review, maybe a project, maybe a project, maybe a, you know, a field, field based kind of a study, study. I think, you know, that freedom. All reports all along also have been talking about, you know, that teacher must be given that kind of an autonomy to evaluate students. That evaluation has to be based on, you know, the experience of a teacher, what he has taught or what she has taught, then, you know, we need to have. Then, of course, the other important aspect when you're talking about teaching is the recruitment of faculty, faculty development programs, nature of faculty which are recruited, very, very significant for us. And different colleges and different universities have different kind of a pattern in terms of recruitment. Some of them are saying public service commissions, recruitment, state service commissions, recruitment. Some of them go by different kind of a criteria. And if you look at, again, all kinds of policy making in this country has been talking about attracting faculty to universities and colleges and retaining them, retaining them. Are we getting the right kind of a talented faculty into the education system? Education system. What is the background? What should be the criteria we need to? It's a very contentious issue. Some of them are now, now, now you know, the new norm says, if you have net, you don't have to have PhD. If I have a, am I right? Net is the basic eligibility criteria. Till recently, that was not the eligibility criteria. And some of them have net and a PhD, and then you know, perhaps you, know, you give a demo. And some universities, they give some kind of a, you know, exam or a test before they're recruited. I think now in Karnataka, recruitment is taking place through Public Service Commission. Am I right? Yes. Public Service Commission. Some of them in the universities, altogether a different kind of a pattern. A professor comes or a teacher comes and makes a, 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 a demo, or maybe he or she has a PhD, a PhD, they come and then they get recruited. And all of you know, I think it's also important for me to read the nature and quality of you know, research degrees we have in this country. It varies from a university to university. It varies from a university to university. And there are also fake universities in India. According to the UGC itself, you know, there are fake universities in India. Am I right, sir? Yeah, yeah there are fake universities in India. So how do we go about, you know, there are also all kinds of dubious uh, degrees. Does that become a benchmark? Does that become uh, a requirement in terms of recruitment of faculty? That is, I think, you know, another uh, thing, you know, we need to think about, you know, clearly, and then evaluation of teaching has to take place. I'm one of those people, as a teacher, firmly believe that there must be feedback mechanism of a teacher at the end of a semester. How many of you have that feedback mechanism? Yeah. And it must be objective. It must be objective. It must be right kind of a feedback mechanism, you know, we should have. That mechanism, feedback mechanism is not to penalize the teacher or to punish a teacher. 
so that you know, we can become better. What do students think about our teaching? To what extent you know, we have delivered in the, in, the, uh, in the classroom become? And then it's also important what kind of a weightage we need to give for teaching, what kind of a weightage we need to give for research. That's a very contentious issue again. How much, you know, we should, you know, should it, should it be uniform? Should it be uniform? I think in the latest, uh, 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 you know, the, pop, uh, the pay scales, you know, which we are likely to get from 2016, some of them said, you know, undergraduate teaching, you know, we don't insist on research. We will only insist on research if we are teaching at a postgraduate level. We do not want to know much of a research at, you know, at the undergraduate level. At the undergraduate level, because undergraduate teachers, you know, do not have, you know, that kind of a facility. But then, research is very, very important. As I've said, knowledge is growing, not by the day. Knowledge is growing by the hour. And how do we go about teaching? How do we go about, you know, updating our students with the latest developments, you know, which are taking place in social sciences, humanities, and science and technology? That, I think, you know, is very, very crucial for us. And then it's also important what are the access we have in terms of national and international linkages. If higher education has to grow, we need to be concerned about you know, what kind of linkages you know, we have with industry, with other universities, with national labs, particularly if you're talking in terms of science, is, is important. I've already talked about you know, nature of research we are doing. It's very, very important. And then, other important thing, what kind of infrastructure facilities we have, what kind of a learning resources we have become you know, very crucial for us. With this background, yeah, with this background, I would like to raise, you know, some issues, you know, which are, which are important for our uh, discussion. All along, you know, when you look at, you know, these are the, some of the major concerns, you know, we have. The primary objective, how do we go about, you know, transforming from the existing education system? I think it's very, very important for our discussion. All the policy documents have been talking about, you know, primary objectives to bring about transformation. How do we go about, you know, transforming from the conventional mode? By using new technology, by making our teaching more innovative, becomes very, very important. That is one of the key issues. It is possible some universities may be doing it. Some of the best of the universities in this country may be doing it, but one of the major challenges, major issues in terms of, you know, what the primary objective is to bring about transformation from the existing pattern we are doing, both in terms of teaching, both in terms of, you know, the nature of examination we need to have. And very important, how do we go about you know, improving standards in terms of quality of education? As I've said, by and large, you know, only 20% of them, you know, have that kind of a skill, that kind of a knowledge. This is not my information. This is information which is given by major research bodies in this country. So the issue is, you know, how do we go about, you know, improving standards? As I've highlighted some of the quality parameters, if we are doing that regularly, and I'm sure, you know, we'll be in a position to improve that kind of a standard in terms of education. Yeah. And then the other important aspect, how do we go about to providing enhancing educational facilities? The 75% of them who do not have access to education, how do they get into education? And at the same time, it's also important that one of the major issues in terms of expansion of facilities in colleges, trying to provide you know, uniform, by and large, some uniform criteria we need to have. I'm not one of those people who believe, want to borrow any example from, you know, but take America as a nation. It's a capitalist country, but they have a common system. Common schooling system, by law, by rule, by regulation, by legislation, you go to a common school. Yes or no? How many of you know that? It's a common school. It's a neighborhood school. But in India, the kind of inequality which is there, again, in, in, in both in school education and higher education, I think it's very, very important. We need to expand, expansion of facilities, both uniform kind of a facilities, by and large. 
Because the degree is the same. Whether you get a no degree from Bihar or get, get a degree from you know, Karnataka or Andhra, it is the same. We need to have you know, some kind of a quality parameters. I have highlighted some of those parameters we need to have. And then improvement of quality, improvement of quality, especially for those areas where, where we have establishing you know, these universities in rural areas. A lot of education is growing in, in rural areas. Many of the universities which are being established are as being established in far-flung areas, and how do we go about you not know, doing it? So that quality of education is important, but then some of the parameters which are much more important for our, I think, to strengthen education, we need to have revitalization of state universities and colleges. We are not simply talking about, you know, when we're talking about higher education in about 45 central universities or institutions of national importance or many of the leading IITs or IIMs. The major challenge, the major issue for us, because more than 80 to 85 percent of them are in these colleges and universities. Central universities, another university, where the kind of a, an opportunity which they provide for younger people in this country is rather limited. 85 percent, a little more than 85 percent of the students are in these colleges and universities. That is my main emphasis. That is my main focus because that is where I think it's important. Yes, of course, there are islands of excellence in India. There are central universities are there, IITs are there. That should not be our concern. They are anyway improving. They are improving, bettering their quality, bettering their quality. But how do we go about re revitalizing these state universities where 85 to 90 percent of the education is there? Education, that is one aspect. And providing greater flexibility for choice of students is very, very important. We are talking about providing greater flexibility, greater choice-based courses, trying to give them the freedom to select, you know, courses is very, very important. Are we doing that when we look at, you know, again, you know, the pattern which is emerging in India? We are not providing that kind of a flexibility which, you know, we need to offer in the 21st century because knowledge is holistic. We are not looking at knowledge in isolation. Understanding, even if you are a student of technology, student of science, you need to get understanding of society. You need to get understanding of society. We are not looking at it in isolation. We are looking at it in a context. The context of social and political and economic and cultural reality of this country. And the reality of this country, as all of you know, is mind-boggling. Because very, very few countries have got the kind of plurality, diversity we have in India. We are a multi-religious country. We are a multilingual country. Multilingual country. Social hierarchy is there in India. Students are coming with very, very difficult kind of a background. And we have got to make them understand. That's where you know, teaching becomes very, very challenging. When we do not understand. Teaching is all about not sympathy. You need to have empathy. You have to put yourself in their position when you are in the classroom. And that is becoming very, very difficult. Do teachers place themselves in terms of you know, other positions, shoes? Are we with them? Are we in a position to communicate with them? at their level. And that is a big, big issue. That is a very, very big issue. Very, very big issue. Because the kind of a nature of problems you know, which we have in colleges and universities, many of them are going through very difficult times. It's depression. And then much more than many, many students are, you know, are not with us. Not with us. Many, many students who know I don't want to talk about are also committing suicides. Why are they committing suicide? Because they're not in a position to cope with. And that is where a teacher needs to have that kind of a sensitivity, that kind of an empathy with them. Are we with them in terms of you know, trying to communicate in the classroom? Are we meeting their, their, their challenges, the different kind of challenges? You know, we have not only academic challenges, but we also need to, when I'm talking about you know, providing greater flexibility and choice for the students, are we having, you know, some kind of ability to interact with them, not only inside the classroom, but outside the classroom? That, I think, is very, very critical for all of us. And, and then <clears throat> removing faculty shortage. 
There are also several universities today which are running, colleges which are running only with academic consultants, guest faculty, part-time teachers. Am I right? I know of several universities, particularly in Andhra and Telangana, there are more academic consultants, or so-called, who come and teach. So, many, many part-time teachers and guest faculty than the regular faculty. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Several universities all over the country, if the regular faculty is about 200 or 300, the guest faculty, part-time faculty, so-called academic consultants who have not been recruited through a regular process are many more. So it is very, very important strengthening, uh, uh, removing faculty shortage. Then the quality will definitely get affected. According to the data, we have almost about, you know, over 50 to 60 percent of the universities have got severe shortage of faculty. No recruitments have taken place. It's, it's important that if we want to enhance you know, the quality of education, that we need to remove that kind of a faculty charges, and, and then funding becomes important. I've, I've started off my discussion by saying, you know, nature of funding we have, we have to definitely see that we get, that we get the right kind of a funding, the right kind of a funding. Technology is growing, infrastructure is growing, and we need to compete, not only compete with the rest of the universities, compete with the rest of the, uh, for funding becomes, you know, becomes important. And then, of course, one of the major things, you know, which is going on in this country is now, that's an important dimension I'm raising, encouraging and promoting private initiative in higher education, including PPP model, public private ship model, which is growing which is one of the major developments which is taking place in India. I have my reservations about, I think, you know, I'm one of those people who know, keep raising, what is the role of the state? Role of the state, role of the government is to provide good education, quality education for us. And the state wants to get away from education, then what is the role of the state then? If the state wants to privatize education, want to get in private universities, want to get in foreign universities, want to get in universities and public-private partnership, then how are we going to be competing? We are soon going to be having another model, public-private modelship, and soon we are going to be having foreign universities coming to India, and then how is that you know, we are going to be competing then? Already private universities have come. We need to compete with those private universities. Education is already getting privatized. In that kind of a context, I'm raising a question, what is the role of the state? State has to fund education. State has a responsibility. State has an accountability in terms of you know, trying to provide. So then, you know, now as all of you know, RUSA also has been constituted. Rastriya, you know, Uchatar, you know, Shiksa Abhyan. RUSA is playing an important role. We need to talk about what are the main objectives of RUSA in terms of policy, policy initiatives. RUSA is very, very important. RUSA, as all of you know, was constituted in 2013 and 2014-15, it has been very effectively trying to do it. What are the objectives of RUSA? Very, very laudable objectives it has got, and I'm sure you know, we are making effort you know, in, time, time, in terms of trying to fulfill those, those objectives. Improving the quality of state of higher education institutions in India. One of the main, main objectives of this contract of RUSA is to improve the quality of state higher education in India. And state higher education in India, as I've said, you know, it is not uniform. There is a lot of inequality in several universities, inequality in higher education. One of the main, major objectives of RUSA is to improve the quality of state higher education institutions in India. We need to have modicum, if not, you know, a certain amount of stability, certain amount of equal quality for all these 800 institutions which are existing in India, whether they're existing in the private sector or in the government sector. Whether they're existing, whether they're central universities, whether they're state universities, it's very, very important that we need to have that kind of a quality in terms of whether they're private institutions, public funded institutions, whether they're deemed universities, whether they're central universities or state universities. One of the major concerns should be that, you know, improving the quality of state higher education in India. <coughs> and reform in the higher education system. What do you mean by reform? As I've already talked about, reform in terms of, you know, what is the nature of curriculum you have, what are the nature of courses we have, how regularly your courses are updated, <coughs> that is important, and then nature of quality we have, and then ultimately 
what is the placement we have in terms of wrong ranking, where are your students placed, how are they getting jobs, what is their position. I think transformation of higher education also means that is one aspect. And the other important aspect which is important is to reform, bring about reform in affiliation. I've already talked about it. Rusa is already concerned about it. Can we have universities which are being governed, 300, 400, 600 universities? We have to, as I've said, affiliation itself is a colonial practice. It came from the British, and we are con still continuing that practice of each university having 100, 200, 300, or 400 universities. It is very, very important that we need to ensure and see that, you know, how we go about you not know, dealing with, however, if we can ensure reform in affiliation system or provide the same kind of quality of education which is there in the mainstream university for which these universities are affiliated. And another important aspect is what is the nature of examination system we have. I've already talked about it. Are we having the right kind of an examination system? Should the teacher have the freedom in terms of deciding what kind of an examination system have? Should we have an end semester exam? Should we have a project? Should we have an evaluation? How much of internal assessment? How much of internal assessment do you have in colleges? Is it 40, 30, 20? 25. 25. How much? 20. 20. There are some colleges right now in the country which are having 20. Some of the colleges are having 25. Some of the colleges are having 30. Some colleges are 40. Some colleges are 50, 50. Some colleges don't have any internal assessment at all. Look at, you know, the variation which is there in pattern. Some of them are 50, 50, 50, 50, in, by and large. And if you look at, you know, the choice-based credit system, what is your understanding about choice-based credit? How much of choice we should give other than your subject which you are teaching? What is the thinking? What is the thinking of the country? Can, can anyone answer that question? 80. Yeah? 80? Who said that? Yeah, very ideal situation. 80? 20. 20. 80. What is the subject you are teaching? Biology. Biology. 80 biology, 20 outside biology. Am I right? Yeah. Are we having that system all over the country? No. Some of them are having two credits, one credit. Some of them are having four credits, four credits. Ideally, we need to have 80% of biology, 20% outside biology. Again, in some of the colleges, biology means he will take another subject only in science. He will take botany course, zoology, or chemistry. That is the flexibility we are offering. The spirit of the choice-based credit system is to get outside your stream. So that you know, knowledge is holistic. And even a technology student should be in a position to understand you know, what is the transformation which is going on in society. society. That understanding, maybe take a course in gender studies. Maybe take a course in literature. Maybe take a course in linguistic competence. That is the idea. 80-20 is ideal, but many of the universities are not having that kind of a pattern. Many of the colleges do not have. Many of the colleges in the country are only teaching commerce and management. Where is the question of going outside the stream to take other courses in social sciences? So one of the major uh, issues you know, we, we need to be talking about is that, and it is very, very important that we need to expand education in a, in a bigger way. Now the country is talking about that we must, in the next you know, five years, minimum get 30 to 35 percent into education. That's a huge challenge. And not simply getting them into education, also provide inclusive education and quality education. What's inclusive? Equity, equality, inclusive, and quality. All of them are important. Access, not only access. Yes, we have been making some kind of an effort in terms of you know, trying to provide access, but then we need to. And another major concern, challenge of education in this country is regional imbalances in higher education. Imbalances within the country, imbalances within the state. Within the state. Sons, universities are located, colleges are located in rural areas, in tribal areas, yeah, Delhi education is very good, but then if you get into 50 or 100 kilometers from Delhi, or you know, Uttar Pradesh, or Bihar, a lot of education is growing 
rather rapidly. But then how do we go about you know, reducing these regional imbalances? Regional imbalances. We are not talking about, you know, when you are talking about enhancing quality of education, we are simply talking about in urban areas. In urban areas. A lot of education is going in rural areas. That, I think, you know, is important that we must correct these regional imbalances in terms of providing both access and also quality of education. Very, very important. That's one of the major challenges we have. A lot of them are coming into rural areas. Are they attracting the right kind of faculty? Are they attracting the right kind of teachers? Are they attracting the right kind of uh, students? Do they have the right kind of facilities? Infrastructure there, learning resources there is very, very uh, important. And ultimately, the entire purpose, whatever we have been talking about, is to improve the both equity in higher education and quality in higher education. I'm using both keywords. Equity is also important. Equity is also important and to just to highlight you know, some of those issues you know, which I've already put it, we have to create university through, there is a discussion going on right now, to create university through upgradation of existing autonomous colleges. A lot of autonomous colleges are there. And you only get you know, autonomy status for a college provided their National Assessment Accreditation Council. How many of your colleges are accredited? Yeah. This accreditation has to be a regular academic activity. In West, accreditation takes place every year. Every year. We are having National Assessment Accreditation every five years. Some of the universities, they do not have it because there's no principal or there's no, you know, university, accreditation takes place every 10 years. More and more universities will come in the university now. Autonomous colleges are growing. Create a new model of degree colleges. <coughs> Pay a lot of attention in terms of creating professional colleges. I've already talked about. <clears throat> and synergizing vocational education with higher education. Very, very important. A lot of vocationalization of education, we are talking about it, wherever it is possible. It's not possible in all universities, but then, you know, it is important to vocationalize education with higher education. Before, you know, we go for tea, I would like to say it is important, you know, that we need to provide support in terms of reform in higher education. It has to take place regularly and restructure higher education and build capacity and outstanding institution. Is that possible? It is possible. Why is that possible? Because if you look at a lot of talent which is there in this country, 40% of the people working with Microsoft are Indians. Yes or no? Look at the talent. Microsoft will shut down if Indians come back. And Microsoft is headed by an Indian. The leading company, Google, is headed by an Indian. 40% of the people working with Microsoft are Indian. 40% of the people working with NASA are Indians. 25% of the people working with Intel are Indian. 20% of the workforce working with Xerox, we should call photocopying, Xerox are Indians. Indians. Look at the leading two corporates in the world are headed by Indians. That is the kind of a talent we have. If only, as I've talked about, the 75% of them who do not have access to higher education get into the domain of higher education we will be a major knowledge power. We will be a major economic power. We will be a major superpower. I will take in some of your questions, and I have got you know, some more areas to cover. I will cover after your tea break. I thank all of you for paying such attention. Though I said in MIT, the average attention span is less than 20 minutes. You have listened to me for almost about over one hour. Thank you very much.